Um, so the goal of this presentation, I mean, it's 15 minutes, 50 minutes, so it's a bit long. So it's to not just have a plain slides something or to have a discussion. So, you know, there are slides, but uh, the goal would be like 30 minutes of slides and then have 20 minutes of discussions, but you can have more discussions if you don't want to look at the slides. That's fine. Um, so maybe who, who doesn't know anything about RISC V? Do you have, so you don't. It's open source, like CPU. Okay, so, so let's look very quickly at what RISC V is. I'm not gonna go into the details and very complicated stuff, like how the boots flow exactly is working. Um, but just let's overview what RISC V is. So uh, RISC V is royalty, so it's completely for free. It's a module, and it's very extensively CPU instruction set. Okay, it started to use in the University of California, Berkeley, um, and we now have we now have RISC-V Foundation, and started 2019 or 18 is fully managing the specification. So it's moved into a foundation with the multiple members, different companies, different universities, collaborating on the specifications, releasing, ratifying it, having different working groups to develop the specifications. It's not anymore within a single university with some contributors that has a bigger framework how it's being managed. Um, so again, the spec is fully uh, open. So it's a CC uh, license. So anyone can take the spec. Uh, there are multiple specifications. There is a private uh, user mode, the debug specifications, which describe different, uh, different parts. Um, the RISC V targets everything from very, very small uh, systems, embedded systems, to a very large system, like supercomputers or large accelerators. Uh, majority probably of RISC V implementations today is gonna be uh, embedded. And there are some companies uh, working on uh, Linux capable systems, some targeting like AR accelerations. For example, Sci-Fi has a Linux capable chip um, Andes also have AP blocks to do that. There is a Speranto company who is who is working on a big little high core count uh, AI accelerator based on the RISC V. So it's very wide uh, application. So it's not the processor itself. Uh, I heard this question that you know people start sometimes think that it's you know a CPU very specific one. No, it's not. And there's also recent discussions on the mailing list, but some people think that you mentioned there's file ability like you run Linux, it's not the case. So only a fraction of the chips are Linux capable. So again, it's gonna, because it's very modular, you don't need to implement specific uh, extensions to get the Linux running, especially if you're targeting variable devices or something that doesn't even need to run Linux. Um, so while the spec is fully open, anyone can take it, anyone can write the course, and there are multiple people who wrote their own course, uh, it doesn't mean that it's supposed to be the course free. So for example, Sci-Fi uh, has a, a Rocket course, that's what they used. It's fully open source. There's another Boom core, which is out of order of execution core, which is also based on Rocket open source. Uh, there's a pull project in Europe, uh, uh, from between Switzerland and Italy, I think, which you have a pulp uh, organization, they have multiple cores, and those are also open, open source. But again, it doesn't mean, for example, Esperanto company, which is designing war, probably the most powerful RISC five chip, there's many cores, and targeting AI, um, I don't think that is, well, we're basing some of the work from the boom, but it's probably not gonna be, you know, open source, it's a commercial product, so, yes? I assume the RISC-V instruction set is distinct from the open power instruction set. Could you compare the two? Um, probably not in a very good way. Uh, but they're both, you know, open instruction So I haven't followed what was happening with our, uh, Open Power Foundation. So I think you can now contribute and probably Power 10 chip is gonna have some contributions through Open Power. I guess that's the direction they're taking. Um, RISC V has, it's, so it defines the spec, different extensions, I'm gonna show in a few slides, but you're also allowed to do your own extensions. So your own proprietary extensions if you need it. Um, so it's fully modular. So the base instruction set allows 32 bits, 64 bits, and 128 bits. 
Uh, of course, the, the only two that matches 32 is 64 bits, 118 bits is not fully frozen. Um, and at least the door is five, what we are focusing is pure 64 bit. So 32 uh, bit uh, ABI is not frozen, so there was just a JLPC release 2.30. And that didn't make uh, the final risk uh, 32 bit changes, so that's another six to 12 months probably before it's going to be frozen. Um, the way it's done is that so all these 32, 64, 128 are independent. So that means you cannot run 32 bit apps on 64 bit RISC 5. You probably can build a chip that has two different modes, but again, there's no like compatibility mode, there's no multi lib. So just pure 64-bit or pure 32-bit or pure 128-bit or whatever. So, so that's a nice thing uh, for people who don't like have multi-libs. <laughs> um, so the way that the licensing is done or the compliance is done in RISC 5, you have to become a member. There are different levels of becoming a member. Um, it, have, it gives you different rights. And once you become a member, you then can actually use the RISC 5 trademarks and put, you know, RIS-5 compliant CPE. So this is how it's being handled. Because if anyone can take in the spec, because it's open source, they do some kind of a changes. It could be RIS-5 based, but it might, might not be RIS-5 compliant chip. So that is being done and uh, managed through RIS-5 Foundation, you know, becoming a member, and then you have the rights to uh, become RIS-5 uh, compliant chip if you make one. And just two days ago, and I think yesterday it went public, that Red Hat is finally joining Refine Foundation, which is very nice. Um, so again, it's very, very modular, so just you know, uh, a look of what it is. Um, so we have a base uh, instruction set. So again, it's RV32I, so that's I stands for integer. Then you have M for multiplication and division, you have A for atomics, you have F for single floats, uh, D for double floats, quad for quad uh, uh, floats, uh, C for compressed. So there are different modules, uh, extensions. And uh, basically the way that software is developed, we have you know, predefined target, which is usually is RV64G, C, um, and that's, so there's a G, C is defined by the Unix spec. So the Linux, uh, FreeBSD, whatever, we all, everyone's targeting that RV64GC 64, uh, 64 GC target. Um, and that's, yeah. And if you want to have a Linux-capable chip, your chip needs to support including compressed instructions. So none of the distros, including Fedora, of course, does not support chips that have not compressed instructions available. Um, I, as far as I know, there's only one chip taped out uh, from Indian Shakti team, which uh, doesn't have a compressed instruction, but the next one's supposed to have. Um, so yeah, it's a bit cryptic. Uh, again, uh, it's basically known as RISC-564, and that's it, but it's the same name, every 64 gc which expands to a very long name, and that long name can also expand to an even longer one, which includes a minor and major revisions in the, in the ECI string. Oops. So again, if you have a very quick look at the what you get, you get 32 registers. The first register is also hardware to zero. Uh, most instructions are going to be 32-bit uh, uh, lengths, and if you have a compressed, those are going to be 16-bit. So some of the very popular instructions can be compressed into 16-bit. Um, because you have multiple extensions, you can build a chip with different extensions, different pieces. It, uh, it also means that you have different ABIs. You have a lot of ABIs. So the one that uh, they're using in the Fedora, and it's, which is the default in the GCC, is called LP64D. So that means 64-bit, and it has everything up to the double floats. Um, Anything like program counter? Hmm? Anything like program counter? Yes, you have a PC, which is at the bottom. Yeah, you have a register. 
forgot. Uh, so building Fedora is complicated because you need the Fedora to build the Fedora. So typical problem. The way you solve that, you kind of attempt to build a very minimal rootfs file system, and you want to get the RPM build, and then start from that building something, and after many, many iterations, starts looking like Fedora. So it looks something like this. You, take a, you build your cross tool chain, so bin utils, uh, GCCs, you took a, take a lot of the common projects like uh, bash, sed, and stuff like that, and you attempt to build a very minimal but bootable on under QMU uh, uh, file system, and you want to get an RPM. So you want to get the, the basics. Um, it's not going to look correct. It might not work correctly. It's probably going to be missing a lot of stuff. So you're going to start uh, adding stuff to your rootfs, and at the same time, you're going to start taking those SRPMs from Akaji and start using RPM build to attempt to rebuild it. So you want to rebuild that small root of S from the RPMs at some point. So it involves a lot of hacking, going back, doing all the worst things that you're not allowed to do in Fedora, but you have to do that to get to the point where it's going to look like Fedora. And at some point, you might be very lucky to start where you can actually import those packages into a Kaji and start building in a more, you know, in a similar way that you do in the Fedora. So the first time uh, it started basically in almost three years ago, or let's say exactly three years ago, by Richard from the Red Hat Visualization Group, and just a few days after I joined and Stefan joined, uh, over a few months we built like 5,000 uh, packages, uh, and we had a somewhat Fedora-looking system. Uh, Richard had a lot of uh, blog posts, so if you want to look exactly what was happening, you can look into those links below. So the project stopped, so the, a lot of stuff are not final, so, and there was a breakage in ABI, and that mean, meant that whatever we built is not exactly what we can use anymore. So the idea was to stop and wait till the final agility patches emerged and restart our work. That took some time, it was finalized, and uh, in at the end of 2017, before we, those uh, changes landed, we should already started uh, testing them. And then so after finding it landed, almost very close to the FOSDEM, uh, we started fully rebuilding uh, the for the final time bootstrapping the Fedora distro. And uh, about in mid, well, mid-April 2018, I got the Kaji running, we imported our packages, and we started actually pulling the source RPM from official Kaji and starting to build that. Of course, um, uh, if you look at whatever we had before with Kaji, it was a mif mix of Fedora 25 till 28. Um, it was very, very complicated beast. And up till now, you're not using Kaji Shadow, so packages are not built in the same order that you're built in official Fedora. So that comes with some problems. Um, so building a distro just for fun, maybe you can do it. I don't know if uh, bootstrapping could be called fun, but I think that the fun comes from when you start seeing uh, it's being used in real life. People use it, people are doing something with it, uh, people are showing something with it. So let's uh, look at a few pictures, I guess. Um, so the first time we booted uh, uh, Fedora in a real harbor, so that's at the sci-fi offices in San Mateo, California. Uh, there is a sci-fi board connected to the Xilinx FPGAs, it's FMC connectors, you know, and then the cable goes to the box, which has the extra PCI Express uh, devices. You have a keyboard and a mouse and a GPU attached. So you get the nice uh, display, not a serial console on your laptop. And it's the first time we actually booted Fedora 28, and they're doing an upgrade on the system. And they're actually running that off SSD. So that's the first time that Fedora landed on the real physical hardware. Um, so we got some boards. So Sci-Fi seeded uh, various development boards to different projects, uh, distros, uh, major uh, programming languages, and stuff like that. So we, Richard has two boards. So one is official Fedora. A board, another one. His his private board. Uh, DJ from uh, Gillipsy has another one, uh, and that's a picture on the right. So again, it's a similar setup. Uh, it's probably the most expensive way to attach SSD. Probably six thousand dollars to attach SSD. 
but at least you don't need to deal with NFC or NBD or whatever uh, network it uh, file storage. Uh, so when I was at Sci-Fi and we first uh, booted Fedora, I, the same night I started working on the GNOME desktop. It took a while, uh, but the same year we got it uh, actually running. It was surprising because it worked out of the box. Um, we spent several days trying to figure out one major issue. We didn't have a mouse and a keyboard working, and it was a very stupid thing. Uh, nothing, just as being dumb, I guess. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it worked. So it, so it boots into initial setup. You set it up, so just as after like normal install, and it works. Um, so Western Digital starts using it in demos. Uh, there is a NAS demo. So it's nice, it works. So this one doesn't use an, um, the Xilinx FPGA. Um, there is an extension board. So what that extension board gives you, it gives you the ability to have SSDs, M.2 SSDs, and PCI Express. Um, another thing, you can actually boot Fedora 29 in X11 mode or in a CLI mode on your browser. So Bellard has a project called J Linux. Uh, and he has the multiple images available on the internet. So if you, has a, you have a Chrome or Firefox, you can go to web and just boot it, play with it. You don't need to install anything on your system, but don't expect high performance. <laughs> um, it's basically based on a tiny emu, which used to be called Risk emu. So we used to support that, and that was the first emulator to actually support graphics output. So at the time, a emu couldn't do any display output. Uh, this was uh, was done yesterday, so the way we we I encourage at least new users to use Fedora's five is you use libvirt. Um, if you go with a QEMU, you need to you know pass a lot of things. Um, everything in Fedora thirty by default should work, um, as far as I know. I tested everything is already in, so it should work out of the box, including a display output. If you wanna do some more testing, you can go and use uh, virt main sig uh, copper repository to pull the latest stuff, latest libvirt, latest virt manager, latest whatever, QEMU builds to play with it. Um, so yeah, so the support is everywhere. Um, uh, I tested at least two device outputs of VGA and Bosch display, that's both work. Um, we also somewhat recently switched from Virtio MMO to Virtio PCI. So that's nice, so all the devices are now connected for PCI Express. If you run a little bit, you get the proper networking, you don't need to set up any bridges or anything. So, um, And all the infrastructure that you're running now is fully libvirt based. Um, so there's also a news article for VOpen. We actually had the like 10 minutes video of how to build the RS5 PC, and that's also uses Fedora, GNOME desktop. Um, so basically, as you can see, people start using it. It's not just a small CLI thing that you can run another QMU. You can actually have a large scale uh, libvirt QMU based setups. Um, you can boot into a GNOME desktop and you can use it. Um, you actually can also play Quake 2 if you have hardware. You can play Quake 2. That's, yeah. I had a match, it's decent performance, had no problems. Um, so the current state, um, so we have a Kaji build farm, so that's a very nice thing to do. We don't have a script that just goes from A to B to Z, whatever, and builds, attempts to build all the packages. So our current build farm has three physical boards. Uh, a couple of them are using NBDs to load the root FS. One is using SSD. Uh, we have one x86-64 node, so that's a main Kaji server. Um, it has everything. The main Kaji storage, uh, uh, all the elements, database, everything. Uh, we have another uh, virtual node with the self storage, which is used for backing up the whole configurations and the Kaji uh, storage in case something happens. And we already had to use it to recover the database, so backups are very important. Uh, we're running 94 QMU instances today, so those are all full core 8 gigs, most, some are. Uh, eight core and 32 gig instances. Uh, and everything is managed by libvirt. Um, we have a new server coming, so it's already running. Uh, we just need to finish the configuration, finish syncing the storage, and we can actually um, 
probably grow even more. So there are some discussions to add more QMU instances. Um, Is there on that on these QMU instances or on that uh, physical QMU? On both. So you're mixing the boards with the QMU instances. Okay. And these QMU instances run on the uh, uh, AMD64 hardware? Yeah. Uh, uh, so you still cross the... Uh, no, we're not cross-built. Uh, no, we are running emulation, so we have virtual machines for QMU. So none of the instances are running on native versus Uh Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, there's no, so uh, right now, there is a patch set being upstream from KVM support. So technically, that's a digital already proved that you can launch uh, multiple virtual guests on a RS5 system. So that's being upstreamed right now. But considering the strengths of the hardware, you don't probably want to run virtual machines in it especially on the build farm. Um, so we started doing uh, a repository um, mirrors to f official Fedora websites. So if something goes terribly wrong, the disk images and all the source, the bug, whatever, all their PMs are available so someone can take that and kickstart a new Kaji instance. So at least uh, some way to survive if something happens. So this is the current statistics from Kaji pulled uh, last night. So we had for 30, probably now 34,000 builds, I guess, by now. Uh, about 7,000 failed for very different reasons. Uh, anything from overloaded main server cannot deliver RPMs to generic errors, uh, to risk file specific errors, to mistakes in building things in the wrong order, and stuff like that. Uh, so you're doing right now master build. So this month we did about 9,000 packages already built successfully. Um, there's one thing that you don't do, or we didn't do for most of the time, was we didn't run any tests. Um, so when we started the Kaji instance, we only had eight VMs, and doing tests is, was expensive. So we had to cut the tests to actually build more packages faster. So as, as we're increasing the number of uh, builders, we can actually, so we have more bandwidth, so we can actually make our jobs longer and, do more proper things. So all the tests are now uh, enabled in Akaji. So if you look at the numbers with the FOSDEM from 2019 and the numbers from today, most of the Fedora builds. Surprisingly, it builds surprisingly without, you know, testing it works and you rarely get any kind of error. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's a good result. Uh, the major missing pieces today uh, was uh, upstream kernel was not able to boot on the board, so 5.3 kernel can finally boot on the board. Uh, we didn't have a LVM Clang stack, and uh, 9.0 or C1 already supports that. Uh, we don't have Rust, but of course, Clang just happening means that Rust is going to happen very soon after, and there's no Golang. Uh, but that's all also already basically done. Carlos, uh, I think he's from Red Hat. Uh, he's working on that, so he has a Golang port working. That includes a Docker, Kubernetes, OpenFast, and other pieces. It's being blocked because the Golang was, is supposed to cut the release, so it's basically frozen for adding a new architecture. So uh, we have problems. So the servers uh, for the Kaji, what we have, is basically very, very, very old. Um, so we have memory issues, we have I.O. issues, um, especially if you want to do fast composes, that's really a terrible thing because you generate about like 150 gigs per repository. If you try to do like two Fedora cycles, it quickly becomes basically a project of moving data, like hundreds of gigs per day to different places. Um, to solve that, we got a new server. So it's full NVMe storage, uh, corporate stuff, you know, loads of IOs, loads of bandwidth. It's not being used yet until we fully can configure that and then can switch to that and finally um, uh, start building fast new composers and images. Uh, our subdomain was added into ASTS preload list, which means automatically redirected to HTTPS, which is bad because of Akadi's configures self-hosted SSL certificate, which of course no one has to install it on the system. So. Um, People started complaining that you cannot access the website, and there is a DNS alias fedora.rs5.rocks, which solves most of the problems until we move to a new server. Um, we still have problems with QMU instances. Um, so 
Every day I have to recreate some of the VMs because the CPU stalls for some unknown reason. And with the five TN5 free kernels, this is the, uh, using the current firmware, we have problems even more. Uh, probably it will be flushes, not fully properly working, and that causes extra instability in the kernels, which is being investigated by multiple companies right now to be solved. Uh, but we think that's a problem uh, with the firmware, firmware that we build and still being investigated where exactly the problem is. So if you're using the latest Fedora's 5 images, you might get extra instability, so that means it might crash in a few days if you're, build, you know, if you're doing a long build. If you just occasionally run it, um, you know, common stuff, boot it, test it something short, it works fine. So, so the problem is if you spend all this time on infrastructure and you have less time to deal with the actual porting stuff, you know, fixing uh, release related uh, stuff, QA stuff. So what's missing? So we don't sign any, sign any RPMs. Um, I somewhat consider that uh, as a feature, so you don't, shouldn't trust it yet. It's not up to the Fedora full standard, so that's one thing. Same as a uh, vert builder repository, it's not signed. If that's something that bothers, bothers you very much and you want to have it signed, it's, it's possible to do, but considering our current server, we cannot do that, but once we move, it should, should have enough bandwidth to start signing RPMs. Uh, we have no body. I don't think that we need it. Uh, we don't have no Punji, so at this point we are using um, so Kaji is uh, generating distribution repositories. It's also generating the images. Um, that works. It's basically the way that ARMv7 works. Uh, but in the future, we probably have to look into two things. So that's a Punji if you want to have modu modularity and then the whole MDS infrastructure, which I think there's no tutorial how to set it up except the ensemble scripts. Um, we don't produce workstation or server images. We probably could do that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, different images that you produce later on. So yeah, so from infrastructure point of view, it's gonna be Punji and, uh, and modularity because otherwise we're missing a, you know, a piece of uh, uh, Fedora. So for the boot stuff, we have no BLS and Fedora is moving to BLS. I think ARMv7 might not have it. Um, the good part is that we have a U-boot. It works on QMU, it works on, uh, on the physical hardware, and we just got a Grub 2.04, which also has Refi support. So technically, you should be able to uh, use U-boot EFI and boot EFI binary of Grub, uh, Grub 2, and then you stop here because kernel doesn't have any EFI stops at this point. That is on the list, but you know, that's the only thing missing piece and then plus bugs, of course. Um, to get something, uh, you know, the boot, get, getting the boot, which looks like, uh, like ER64. Um, so because we do have a U-boot, that means we finally can actually install a new kernel and reboot a QMU instance, which was not the case before because you have to pass the binaries directly to QMU or libvirt. So that's a very nice addition. We didn't run, and again, we didn't run any tests, which uh, we do now, so finally, uh, because we do have a bandwidth to do that. So custom bits, uh, so we don't use a Kaji shadow. That's probably my fault. I did try it once. I followed the configuration, you know, there was a wiki page from 2015 with some to-do list of, uh, you know, not fully described, but how it's supposed to work. Um, I did that, I launched it, so I was paranoid and waited, looked at the screen for like one hour or something, and there's a lot of NVR comparing that, comparing that, replaced by a newer NVR and stuff like that, and it's finally imported a single package from Fedora Core 12, and I killed it. So, uh, you know, that was like too far ahead. So, so I'm a bit afraid of what Koji Shadow could do to the current state if it starts tagging packages from Fedora Core 12, um, because the last tag package is the one which is in, ends up in the repository. So I, we should use a Kaji Shadow. I think that would be a requirement to do that. So, but I currently don't have the correct documentation of how to set it up, but it doesn't go that deep. And I just want to have the recent stuff that goes in the Kaji 
official kaji to go directly to my kaji, not to go all the way to dinosaur age and try to you know import something that I don't want to have in my kaji. Uh, we also didn't produce the Serpian packages the way the Kaji did because that was expensive. So setting, setting up a build route takes one hour, and then you have to wait like one to two hours to get your Serpian. So that was done on x86 target, you know, in a Docker and a Podman at the beginning. And you also had uh, to, you all also didn't want to submit the packages, but you know it's going to fail because that's also expensive, especially if you have like eight virtual machines. So I had my own script, kind of my own Kaji Shadow, which also you know, pulled the DNF uh, data from our Kaji, checked all the requirements, tried to figure out if we can get them, and then submit the bills. And the success rate of our build was like, we could hit like 90% of, which was quite good. Um, we do have SCM overlay for this Git. So that's a separate repository. It holds everything that I'm hacking on. So. Um, if the release has dot number dot risk five before the dist, that means I did something to that package. So it's either a patch applied, which is not upstreamed or upstream but not in the release, or had to make changes to the spec file and it didn't yet push them to, to, to the disk git. So that's, you know, I changed something, there's pro probably going to be a change log entry of what I did, and there is a separate SCM. And also, that means that I can ch make changes without, you know, waiting like two weeks to four weeks until someone, uh, you know, reacts on a disk git. Uh, disk images, so basically we're free now. Uh, there is a developer, what they call, which is like a kitchen sink. It has everything that you would like to do RPMs. It has mil minimal X11 support, debuggers, Emacs, Vims. Uh, everything you might want to do, even manipulate virtual disk images. So the problem is if you want to boot a system and you want to get the package, you might need to wait 10 minutes to get it. And if you want to have like, you know, oh, I'm missing a Git, another 10 minutes, I'm missing my Vim, another 10 minutes, I'm missing that, another 10 minutes. So it's very annoying. DNF and parsing XML files, I believe, the last time we looked. But DNF is slow. Um, so yeah, and there's a GNOME disk image, uh, which basically developer plus whatever you needed to run the GNOME desktop, and there is the minimal. So some people don't want to spend, you know, download one gigabyte, we just need to boot and say that it works. So for example, virtualization people, we just need something small that boots. So that's basically, that's it. Uh, again, we probably could build workstation or server at this point. I don't exactly see something blocking us, but it needs to be investigated. Um, so sorry, sorry you, uh, what you mentioned, it, it is so slow on the virtualized you, Yes, you yes, if you have a hardware, it's somewhat fast. On hardware, it works. Yeah, it's, it's decent, hardware. yes. Okay. Yeah, on a, on a QMU, uh, well, unless you have like Intel's 5.2 gigahertz system running, probably you're not going to have any problem. Uh, if you're running on a laptop, like I tend to do, then it's going to be slow. Uh, disk images, so we started to have a bless disk images, so that means I take some image, I boot it, let the QMU, I start playing with it, seeing if things working, you know, if everything on the systemd looks green. So those images are posted on uh, fedoraproject.org, so you can get those. You can pull directly images from the Kaji. If you want to look at all oh, old stage four disk images, that's also still available. Um, we don't provide disk images for the board. so. All because it didn't, there wasn't support in upstream kernel. Um, I didn't want to pull in a large number of, you know, uh, moving patches. Um, so anyone who wanted to do the board, run the door on the board, they had to build their own kernels. Um, this is going to be changing very soon because 5.3 can do that. So after we finish master build, how long, I don't know how long it's going to take yet. I can, I'm going to start looking at a Firefree kernel and actually having an image that can boot on the board out of the box. Uh, I also set up a virt builder repository. Again, it's not a signed one, but it uh, uh, makes your life easier because you can just have a uh, virt builder to generate your disk images, uh, do modifications to it, you know, change the size, host, passwords, whatever. And then you can do virt install to get it uh, into your libvirt. And uh, the only thing you need to extract from the from that disk image is your firmware blob. Uh, so that's what the, is an open SBI with a U-boot. 
Um, it's also available on the uh, web page if you, if you follow the first link on the disk images. It's also extracted, so if you don't want to deal with the disk images, you don't need to, to deal. So the targets that you support is the QMU, Libvirt QMU setup, and uh, we used to support, at least the older disk images also work with a tiny EMU, but we moved so far ahead that it's not uh, fully working now. So if you, if you pull an old, old Fedora image that's still gonna work with tiny EMU, newer ones not gonna work. There's a physical board, as I mentioned, the 5.3 is gonna support it, uh, and we're gonna do, uh, so yeah, that's gonna be in disk images as soon as we can finish the master build, and uh, if you want to run this microSM expansion board, you're probably not going to have those patches in. So we're going to only support the board, not the old expansion stuff that you can add to it today. And all the instructions are available on the Fedora wiki page. Uh, so annoying bits, so configure, config scripts. Uh, so config.guess and sub is still a case. So there is... Uh, configure a macro which uh, attempts to replace it, but not always work. Um, so that's still a bit annoying. Um, there is a, somewhat an issue with Atomics. So RIS-5 only supports word size Atomics and everything else goes from Libatomic. And people tend to use minus LP thread, which is not the correct way to use. You have to use minus P thread and that expands to different things on the different platforms. So apparently a lot of packages do that. Um, so they use minus LP thread, and then that happens that you get undefined references to libatomic calls because the compiler is not going to take care of it. So the current GC does not inline those libatomic calls. Uh, you can fix that by manually linking to lib, uh, minus uh, to libatomic, or you can probably, I'm somewhat considering, but not doing it yet, is actually replacing libp thread with uh, uh, linker script a similar way like uh, libc works. So it automatically includes uh, as needed minus L atomic minus minus as no needed. Um, so if you do use minus p thread uh, on the risk 5 this is GCC, so the GCC is going to do correct thing for the spec and it's going to link minus L atomic. Uh, another thing, for example, uh, was uh, dynamic sections being read only in the risk 5 Re other architecture that does that is MIPS, and then web streaming was happening in the GLIPC that was copied from the MIPS file, so, so technically that comment is wrong because the spec doesn't require it to be read-only, but now it's part of ABI. Um, and another thing is that the libraries live in a bit of different location. So you have slash usr slash lib64, and then you have an ABI. And again, we're using LP64D as an ABI. The way we solve that in the Fedora, we have a symlinks to, to a parent directory, so that works. So we can use either the official uh, RISC-V defined location for the library, so we can still use the same slash lib64, and that still points to the same thing. And we found no problems with that. And many ideas, so again, we have to move to new server, uh, there are still ongoing discussions with the audit, so uh, I upstream the audit uh, framework in the kernel. Uh, the library in the user space is a bit blocked because uh, the maintainer wants to refactor the library, doesn't want to take the tables for risk of fire architecture because then someone might not maintain them and then it's gonna, you know, typical problems. The second patch also exists. I, I have it included in Fedora disk images. I have to send out the v2 version to the kernel mail links list, but basically it works except one kernel self-test is failing, which is a new addition. So I still need to look. So we still have packages in this git. Uh, we probably have a hundred of them, which I still need to go and check and probably submit to this git or push some patches to upstream. But that's, you know, going slow because uh, infrastructure number one, if that's not running, so there's no Fedora, there's five. And, you know, we had a lot of uh, new changes. We have Dlang now working. We have Ada compiler. We have Free Pascal working. We have Haskell compilers. The missing pieces are Rust, uh, LLVM Clang, which is basically done. Once it lands in official card, I'm going to pull that in, and that's going to work, or supposedly going to work. Um, and the Golang, which also exists, but it's not yet merged because it's blocked by upcoming Golang release. Um, I'm supposed to use a Cardi Shadow, but I'm a bit afraid of it, again, because I'm not fully sure what it's going to do to the current Cardi state. Um, 
we, we used to have a Berkeley bootloader uh, before we had the proper firmware, which is you know, open as behind the U-boot, so that's also solved, and again, you can install new kernels and can reboot, and you don't need to kind of kill a VM, change your CLI arguments to a new kernel and boot it, so that's very nice. And then officially produce the, uh, the images for the board. And there are a number of companies that directly support Fedora S5, directly and not directly, so most of the servers that we use for builders are old Facebook servers today, uh, hosted by uh, GCC Compile Farm uh, Project. Um, and Sci-Fi donated the boards, Tranquility donated the initial Kaji servers, backup servers, uh, Western Digital also donated the storage for the new server. So a lot of, so a lot of individuals, a lot of individuals from Red Hat, different companies, specs. Um, so it's, it's moving very fast and it's expanding very fast. So, oh, that's long, so, but we still have time for questions. No, it's a separate one as far as I know. Uh, I think there might be, there are still discussions changed uh, to some potential changes for virtualization, so I, I, don't, I don't think that the spec is frozen at this point. Ah, so the specification yes, so there's a key, uh, key um, so we started working on an implementation, there are some ideas how to improve uh, the performance and stuff like that, so there are some discussions of what can be done and improved. It's still going to work, but you know, in the future, it might work a bit more efficient. But it's not even baseline. Yeah. The, well, the baseline is just integer. That's it. You don't get even atomic multiplications, flows, nothing. So. The the yes. Uh, yes. That probably not gets. I. I need to look at this. <laughs> but basically, you can build a very, very minimal chip without anything much. Um, yeah, I'm more interested. For well, Linux is RV64 GC, that's uh, defined in the RISC V Unix uh, platform specification. So it's not instruction set. So instruction set defines a, a, a basic software target, which is RV64 G. That's the G stands for integer multiplications, uh, atomics. So you know defines a set of extensions that you want to have, and then this, the Unix spec defines that oh you need also extra compressed instructions, you need to, you know, this virtual memory stuff, you need this and that for your Linux yeah, system. And then, sorry, I missed my question. My okay. short question was that, does the Unix baseline do this? It doesn't talk about that. So the spec is very short today. Um, so RISC-V Foundation has started a task group to define, you know, have a very well-written document of what's even Unix. And they, it, that, it's also named as a Unix spec specification, but it's a bit wrong because you want to have specification not only for the Unix-like systems, but you know, beyond that, so you might have a different profiles for different kind of systems you want to target, like, like embedded, uh, you know, needs a different target. So that, it's not frozen. So it's, again, there's a, a working group, a task group within the RISC-V Foundation which is working on that specification. This also includes an open SBI or SBI supervisor binary interface, uh, firmware interface basically. So that's still very much moving target. So we just needed to have something as a base. So it ended up being like two paragraphs at the beginning. It, it was reformatted recently, but it haven't moved very far from that. So it's very basic, not like something that you could get from ARM. If you have a custom patches, yes. Like with the hardware virtualization support, there is no hardware virtualization. And if you, could you compare what is the computing power of this high five board and uh, either a regular mobile phone with some so, uh, or, or, and or AMD, Intel, yeah. notebook chip? So the way that sci-fi at least, uh, compares the chip. So the current Sci-Fi Unleashed board is, uh, I think it's U54 cores. There are four cores of that, and that's performance like uh, Cortex-A53. And the next generation, U74, I think, is the market is as uh, similar to Cortex-A55. Like, for example, kernel 
Uh, the way we found it, but surprisingly not. Well, it depends on your host machine. Uh, but uh, if you compare our builder systems, we find that uh, uh, the board is still faster, like building kernels or GCCs. So if you have a very complicated, like C++ project, the board is still better than running on the KMU. Well, un unless again you have like high performance Intel or AMD chip, which can boost it like 5.2 gigahertz or something. Uh, in that case, I don't know the numbers, but you might be, be as performant as a board, or maybe even better. Uh, you can go up to eight uh, cores on the QMU instance. That's the limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, kind of like old times, uh, old school question here. Um, in Thailand, like the traditional one, GPS, the traditional Do you know if as part of the consortium there was some plan in Thailand to develop this style CI or CIM project? So my suggestion was like two years ago, but we need something maybe like Linar Developer Cloud so that the people can actually get some allocations of the boards to, to run the CIs, do you know, porting or performance uh, checks. Uh, today, that's not the case. Sci-Fi was the first company to seed the development boards, physical boards for free to like Debian, Golang people. So anyone who's working on some major project could get the physical board so we would have direct access to it. Um, the rest, it depends. I mean, it's... So the answer is like, no, that's probably too true. Yes, I mean, I would like to have that. Um, I mentioned that, um, but we don't have it yet. And I'm not sure if it's gonna be in the future, but I think that would be great. Me too. Yeah. Hey. So this, uh, which, uh, it checks my card instance, and if my card instance has a newer package, or? If your card has a newer package than the one that's in the builder, it will use the newer package. Okay. If, does, if it's in the tag, it uses the latest one. Okay. So. Does anyone plan to write the full documentation for card shadow? That would be great. It's the code, the documentation. <laughs> yeah, so that was my idea. The only way to figure out what the card shadow is doing, just take a code on, you know, and read it. So yeah, so I think in the future, um, Kaji Shadow is something that we need if you want to ever become an official secondary architecture. So we, yeah. So I, I, I would I kind of want to avoid it, but I can avoid it. Yeah, that would be great. And you could update the wiki page to maybe. <laughs> So GCGO works. That's the first thing we tried, and that works. Um, there might be a small, smallish issue within the Fedora in the future uh, related to libffi. So the problem is that uh, Fedora uses the last official release, which apparently some distros don't even use because uh, the it, libffi is not being released, and the maintainer is very slow, I believe. So the RISC V is merged in. It's even the patches are merged on the GCC copy of BlueDFFI. So at some point, it would be nice if Fedora could bump to something to a Git version, you know, specific Git commit of BlueDFFI because I don't expect to have any release in the next whatever few years, if ever. Um, well, that's the interesting questions. Uh, I think we are the first ones. Uh, so we worked very close with Debian, believe it or not, but I would say that Fedora is partly a Debian and Fedora baby. <laughs> uh, you, you're gonna even find the Debian people in the Fedora is part channel, and we're discussing all the things. Um, we had more bandwidth, so human power to push it through. So I think we got in a better shape and we still maybe delivering some things faster than Debian. But they, again, I'm not fully sure because I'm not running a Debian. 
Um, but I was working just a full time for, for a year, so I had the bandwidth to push things faster. And Fedora, to some people, are interesting, mainly Rawhide, so it's a fast moving target. So we want to be too fast in this case. And that, for example, my uh, this Git overlay allows me to be too fast. If there is a package, someone comes in and says we need it for academic research, or I'm a developer and I need that, you know, then that's what I can do without actually waiting, you know, whatever it takes, weeks, days, or whatever to get that in a disk git, even if it's not yet fully merged or something. For example, I am planning to add a Golang and not waiting for the next Golang release, for example, because people want to use it. Yeah. So there's no board specification, um, but the at least Sci-Fi board has the V9 chip, which stores uh, one of the, I think it's called FST, FSBL uh, bootloader, which also has a DTB file, which can be flashed as a newer build, which might, may or may not be replaced in the future with open boot SPL. So in that case, you most likely want to uh, end up uh, in a uh, RISC-5 Foundation platform specification task group and say that you know, that's something you want to put in a spec. Yeah, and it's, uh, and, uh, it's a big problem that you know, every board uses you know, a different way to DDD, you know, use it into location or do something more you know, funky. And if everyone had a slide flash, then yeah. it just flashes into it. So, Today, I, I, don't ha I don't have an idea how to support multiple boards. So, I mean, there's a single board. There is an Andes platform that also has a U-boot and MMC support, so we technically could do that, but we don't produce chips. We have the same as a sci-fi, we, we are targeting a custom solutions. So, but uh, only sci-fi released uh, a chip that can be used by developers. That, so the boot stuff is not being yet defined. It's being worked also part of that working group to, if, as far as I know. So if you want to define, you want to have some concerns, that's where you should raise them. Um, other than that, RISC-V was added to ACPI, UFI, uh, Redfish, and PC, PC bias specs. We, there is a Tiano core which can boot on a FPGA chip and get into a shell. There is a grep 2.04, which also supports RIS-5 EFI, and the U-boot also supports it on the RIS-5. Again, the only missing piece in the kernel to you is EFI stubs. Yeah, no, I think the question was more about like, the specification standardization, right? Yeah. So, it needs yeah, it, it has to be at some point. And again, it's a working work in progress. If you have concerns about where you're supposed to, but the best place to raise it, or at least on the various uh, open mailing list, that that's what you like to have, and you know what is your reasoning. Uh, I personally don't expect to have a full channel core running on on the boards. Uh, the best I could expect is something EBBR like. And you know, my target, my personal target, is something that ARC64 has. Uh, we're slowly moving towards that. More questions? Okay, thank you.